to our keynote speaker, Elizabeth Jordan Carr. We are thrilled to have her here with us today. If you don't know, Elizabeth is and became the first baby born through in vitro fertilization here in the United States in 1981. Because of that, she's been followed and watched by the press since her birth. She attended her first press conference at the age of three days old. She's been on the cover of Life magazine as a baby and even had cameras following her around at high school football games. With all that media attention, Elizabeth has put it to good use and became a journalist herself. She's currently the social media marketing manager for the Boston Globe, Boston.com. On Being Normal is the title of Elizabeth's speech today, and we are thrilled to have her here. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Elizabeth Jordan. I can't start saying anything until I say, go Red Sox! <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me because it means I don't have to cover the parade in the rain. Um, <laughs> so uh, I appreciate that. Um, and thank you so much for having me, Rizal. Uh, it's, it's great to be here um, and so nice to have resources available for people. So as Erin said, people have followed me all my life, and I mean all my life, as in my first baby photo was as an embryo. Um, PBS cameras taped my birth, and, attended, and I attended my first press conference at three days old, and I yawned through the entire thing. My baby face appeared on the cover of Life magazine, and my stories have appeared in newspapers worldwide, including the Boston Globe, where I now work, which isn't awkward at all. <laughs> uh, I don't have a baby book. I have five volumes of newspaper headlines and VHS tapes from television announcements worldwide and a hand-drawn cartoon from Newsday hanging on a wall of me inside of a test tube. Those are the mementos my parents saved for me. I, on the other hand, have saved totally mundane things for my own son to look through when he's older. A tiny onesie, his favorite hat, a red blanket with white and red caterpillars on it. Me? My parents saved the dress that I was baptized in and gave it to the Smithsonian because, well, the museum asked for it. That's my normal. I didn't ask to be America's first test tube baby, but in 1981, on December 28th, it just happened. My parents and doctors, however, did all the hard work. I just showed up. In school, friends knew I was in vitro, but they didn't quite know what that meant. I was never teased, but some people would want to sit next to me at the high school football game because a camera crew was right behind me following me around. And it's a little bit embarrassing to go to the prom and have your date pick you up with the cover of Life magazine in the front hall. And they're looking at you, and they're looking at the cover, and they're going, oh, okay, this is happening. Um, so when you go to a supermarket and you see your face on the cover of a tabloid and your college roommate says, is that you? And you have to say, yes, it is. <laughs> Although I've been the subject of news reports for as long as I can remember, I've always wanted to tell the story of medical reproductive technologies that no one's heard. It's a story about being perfect and about trying to prove that you are worth all the effort and that you are actually normal. It's a story that I was born to tell. The starting point for me begins with Operation Santa Claus. That was the code word for my highly anticipated and highly orchestrated birth. At Norfolk General, the hospital where I was born, personnel had to have a special badge um, for clearance to get into the wing of the hospital that was closed off for my mother where she had a room. The press was given a fake description of my father so that he could come and go without being questioned. And as a journalist, I keep wondering, was my father stealthy or were the journalists just not as dogged as I would have been to figure out who the husband was? <laughs> News vans with giant satellite trucks took up the entire parking lot and lined a block where the hospital stood. By her own admission, my mother didn't know she was going to be the first woman in the US to have an IVF baby when doctors Howard and Georgiana told her as much. If it were me, and I was delivered that news, I would have panicked right there on the spot, but somehow my parents did not. When she found out that she was pregnant, 
my mom's told me. She was excited, but extremely cautious. You see, she never had trouble getting pregnant. The trouble always stay was with staying pregnant. My mother had three ectopic pregnancies before she sought help from the small clinic in Virginia. And all she and my dad wanted was a child of their own and to have a family. That desire, I think, is what allowed them to have the strength and courage to overcome any kind of fear or doubt they had about this unproven thing called IVF. When the doctors confirmed that my mother was indeed pregnant, they told my parents that there would be opposition to this, and they gave them the option to keep their story private. Their names would not have to be released, the doctor said, and my mother could give birth in a hospital in Massachusetts where IVF was illegal at the time, if she so desired. But my parents decided on the spot they didn't want to keep their story private. They felt that if their face and journey against infertility could, overcome, could be overcome through technology and it would help just one family, that they too could have a child of their own, then the lack of privacy would be worth it. So they decided they would have their baby in Virginia since it was home to the cutting edge technology where other states had banned it. Growing up, I always knew my parents were strong and brave, but now, as an adult, I know just how strong and brave. In fact, my mom came with me today. Wave hi, mom. I'd love to embarrass her as a daughter. <laughs> At the time my mom and dad were going through IVF, there were still those opposed to the idea of reproductive technologies altogether, saying doctors were playing God and creating designer babies, and the Pope was against the procedure, and still is to this day, and Pope, let's have coffee. Uh, <laughs> the process of IVF seems almost simple when I explain it to people now. An egg and a sperm were fertilized in a petri dish, and then once the sperm had fertilized the egg, it was put back in the mother's womb, and ta-da, it pops a normal baby nine months later. It seems downright, uh, you know, medieval at this point. And that's just one procedure. There are so many options now. There weren't even around. FET, GIFT, and ZIFT, and to those on the outside, they're just acronyms. But here, in this room, they're real, viable options. My parents thought of adoption, too, which comes with its own struggles. All of the people involved in Operation Santa Claus knew they were going to witness history. History that would either further assisted reproductive technologies in the United States or effectively end it. No pressure on me. <laughs> I'm not sure my parents thought about that fact. If they did not have a normal, healthy child, that their chances of IVF ever being tried again in the United States would be slim to none or at least very, very, very postponed. I am sure, though, that they thought about it. Even my doctors thought about it. I only know this because I've heard about the existence of a short statement on a piece of paper in Dr. Howard Jones' Jones' pocket to read to the media if I did not turn out to be healthy and something went wrong. I don't know what the paper said, thank goodness. All I know is that it was ripped up the moment I came out and it was pronounced to the world a beautiful, healthy baby girl. Dr. Jones and I have never talked about what was on that paper, and it's scary sometimes to think that so much was riding on the birth of just one child. Much has been written about the science behind my birth and how I'm just now one of more than five million test tube babies worldwide. Countless stories have been written about science and technology behind designer babies, but very little has been said about the social and psychological ramifications of these technologies on us kids. How does a child like me, as a sixth grader, sit through a health class where they're showing a video about the birds and the bees and had neither the birds nor the bees being born the way that I was. If you're me, you raise your hand and explain it. My health teacher loved that. <laughs> when I came to realize that my parents had to go through so much simply to have a child of their own physically, emotionally, financially, I could not help but feel an incredible pressure to hope that I was worth all of the effort. When you're old enough to realize that, that your birth is basically a, a vision of hope for a way out of fertility for so many people, it sort of paralyzes you. It's a lot, a lot of pressure. It's the kind of pressure that makes you ask, did I live up to everyone's hopes, and am I the child and adult my parents hoped and wished I'd become? But that's the thing. That alone is the proof that children of assisted reproductive technologies are just like everybody else. We all feel that pressure some way. We all, deep down, want to be the children our parents hoped we'd be. 
it's downright normal. My parents and I are often asked for advice from doctors and parents of children of assisted reproductive technologies on how and when to tell your child that they became a part of your family. I have always known, I think. <laughs> the first time I realized I was not like everybody else was also the first time I watched the Nova documentary of my birth, A Daughter for Judy. Uh, for all intents and purposes, this is my only home movie, even though it went through months of filming, editing, and post-production. Minor technicality, right? I mean, that, that's how everybody's home movies are. The experience of watching it for the first time, however, was not unlike, was unlike popping in a home movie that makes you nostalgic. <coughs> Instead, it was very much an experience where I can remember thinking that I was watching history unfold, and not just any history, it was my history and world history, and I was the one making the history. It's very, very strange. I've seen the footnotes that I haven't memorized. A young mother quietly walks behind her husband, cradling her tiny newborn in her arms. The dark-haired trio takes their seats in front of hundreds of news reporters, Camera crews from local and overseas televisions and radio stations crowd around them. They don't seem overwhelmed by all the press and instead are too busy gazing down at their daughter to look up in order for photographers to get that perfect shot. The sound of the constantly clicking camera shutters is lulling the baby girl to sleep. She is three days old and this will be her first but not her last press conference. <coughs> I obviously don't remember the exact day because I was just a newborn, but I do remember watching that scene so many times. I actually watched it in a room full of doctors, reporters, and parents and children of IVF who were part of the first batch of 10 babies to come out of the clinic where I was born. I was about five, sporting a bowl haircut and probably tights that I couldn't keep up, and black and white saddle shoes, basically the quintessential New England preppy, but like miniaturized. <laughs> when the film got to the part where my doctor, Dr. Howard Jones, announced my birth, I remember looking over at him from beneath my heavy bangs and smiling, and then quickly looking back down at my shoes as if I needed to watch what was unfolding on the screen with some degree of reverence. Even at that young age, I knew this wasn't something this doctor got to d announce every day with the entire world watching. This morning at 7.46 a.m., a daughter was born to Mrs. Judith Carr, a 28-year-old school teacher, and the father, Mr. Roger Carr, a 30-year-old mechanical engineer, the footage played. I remember thinking that there was no way that little baby was me, because I was just an average little girl, and judging by all the fuss that people were making over this baby, this baby was special, and she was the first. When the documentary was finished, I remember everyone in the screening room turning around to see my reaction. That moment when all those people turned around to look at me, that's when it happened. That's when I was asked the weirdest question I've ever been asked. What did I think of watching a documentary from my own birth? For a five-year-old, it's kind of a meta question. I remember <laughs> fidgeting in my seat between my pioneering doctors and swinging my legs while I searched for a good answer. What did I, a little girl who was the central character of this history-making event, think of herself? Looking back on it, I know there's no actual good answer for such a bizarre question. The adult in me, the one with the outrageous sense of humor and tendency to go for big laughs, looks back and wants the five-year-old to say something ridiculous like, where's my modeling contract? Or, what? Did we get the cheap seats? <laughs> But the five-year-old with the bowl cut and the bunchy tights, of course, did not shout anything of the sort. Thank goodness my mother would have been mortified. I think part of me must have known that everyone was looking at me to utter something poignant or profound about my own existence. Every reporter in the room that day had their eyes trained on me. They noted every fidget, every giggle, and every blank stare on my face. When it was over, I turned to my team of doctors who had surrounded me for the screening and answered that ridiculous question in the best way that I knew how, with my own simple question. Are all babies that slimy when they come out? <laughs> Everyone laughed, and the reporters scribbled furiously. It was, of course, the perfect quote. Heck, it was almost normal. What I know now that I didn't know then is that every family going through infertility has a moment like that. A moment where it becomes clear that this is their normal. Today, I hope you all find a path 
to your normal, and you've got great resources here to do it. Thank you very much. Okay, Elizabeth has actually generously offered to do some Q&A, so does anyone have any questions? Wow, a quiet room. Come on, I wasn't that good. <laughs> Are you still in touch with Dr. Jones? Yes. Uh, Dr. Jones is how old? 103. Um, and still goes to the office every day, sharp as a tack. Um, still lobbying for insurance coverage in places that it doesn't happen. He calls every birthday and Christmas. He's, um, he wants to Skype with my three-year-old. Um, he Skypes at 103. I mean, this is the, this is the kind of... You know, he did IVF in his retirement from John Hopkins. So yeah, I'm, I'm still very much in touch with him. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. I'm not sure how much you know about the new technology surrounding IVF, but what do you think about it? What do you think about what's happened over the past 30 years? I think I can't keep up. <laughs> I mean, um, my mother will tell you, just uh, probably six or seven years ago, we went to an opening of a new clinic um, in Virginia. And we, Mom and I got the tour, and just even taking the tour, it was incredible how efficient and how different the procedure is. You know, she'll tell you stories of having to lay in an uncomfortable position, on, like with a pressure on her neck to elevate certain parts, and you know, she could only have like a demi-task of coffee, and everything was so strict, and you know, now a lot of it's outpatient, and um, like I said, it's a lot more complicated, so there's a lot more choices, which is both fantastic and also just mind-boggling. I don't think, if I had to go through uh, infertility um, you know, options and treatments, I really don't know where I would start. I think it's probably a good, if you ask my mother, I think she'll probably say it's probably a good thing that there weren't so many options back then. And it took, I was just one egg, that was it. I mean, they put one in and here I am. So. I just wanted to say I think it's really nice that you honor your parents. So, yeah. just, you know, it's really, it took a lot of courage to do what you do, especially at the time that you did it. So I think all of us here thank you. Absolutely. I agree. I was thinking that as an IVF mother, as someone who went through it, that you're a pioneer, that you did something for us, a lot of us in this room, that might not might not be happening if it weren't for you or so thank you. We're going to get Judy up there. <laughs> She's a good date. <laughs> yes? Um, great speech, so thanks for giving it. Oh, yeah. um, okay. Quick question uh, regarding your encounters, if any, with naysayers out there, and if, if you have any encounters, how do you Oh, I've had plenty. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny because I just repeat the question. Oh, as she asked um, if I've encountered any naysayers and what do I say to them. Um, and so, you know, I, especially being a journalist, it's not like I've gone on to live a you know quiet, um, very private life. Um, and so um, it's very easy to find me. If you want to email me, my face and name and phone number are plastered all over um, various news websites all over the world. So um, I often get comments that, um, you know, I'm a child of the devil and, you know, things like that. Uh, and I always have the same reaction. Um, I can understand, um, you know, really having a moral problem with um, not natural birth. I understand that from a logical or a religious standpoint. Um, but really what it all comes down to is there were two people, my parents, who wanted to have a child. It didn't matter if that child was adopted. It didn't matter if that child was an IVF baby. It didn't matter how many years or how long it took. They just wanted to have a family. And that's what they got. And ultimately, to me, that's what I stress to people is that, you know, there's nothing more natural than wanting to have a family and become a mother. So, um, 
and you know it's funny because I also people always ask me um, did I have a, a normal child <laughs> which always cracks me up because I'm not normal um, but I, I had a natural birth I did not go through IVF or anything to have my son but when I was little I always thought that that's how you had kids like it didn't occur to me that that wasn't the optimum way to have a child. I just figured I'd have an IVF baby, just like my parents did, you know, whatever, I'd go to Virginia. It, it just never dawned on me until I was at least like 13 that it was like, oh, right, okay, there's another way to do this. So. <laughs> So I have a child that I carried and a child that I didn't carry. And there's that constant struggle of what is the child that I didn't carry going to think about the child I did carry. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's great how you instill this sense of normalcy in her life. Like this is normal for you and you embrace it. So it's just refreshing to hear that whatever your normal is, it's accepted by the, the child. And so I, I think that's great for, for both of you. Yeah. The, the, um there's one question that I'm always asked every t every time I have an article or I go on television or something, and as a journalist it makes me cringe. I just hate. I feel like it's a lazy question, um, which is, um, do you feel normal? <laughs> and I always kind of look at the people, and part of me wants to be like, actually, I have superpowers, and there's an antenna in the back of my head, but I, I hide it. Um, and then the other part of me you know, really thoughtfully thinks about it and says, well, I'm 31 years old and it has always been this way for me. This is just my life. This is how it is. So what? This is just normal. That's all there is to it. There's the, 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 don't ask me if I feel normal because I really don't know. <laughs> Thank you all so much.